righteousness covers us like a garment. His life counts for our life. And the merit of his obedience accrues to us. That lifetime of good works and obedience to the law that he rendered, that counts for us. Just as my sin was imputed to him so that he could pay the full price of it for me in exactly that same way, his perfect light life counts as mine by imputation. That great exchange is the very essence of the doctrine of justification. It's more than just the forgiveness of my sins. Don't, don't, don't reduce the doctrine of justification to forgiveness only. It's much more than that. It includes forgiveness. But if God simply forgave me all my transgressions, that would just leave me with a blank slate. He doesn't do that. The positive merit of Christ's righteousness is credited to my account. So I don't have a blank slate. I get full credit for all the perfection of Christ's divine righteousness manifest in his holy life as a man. That's imputed to me and to you if you're a believer in Christ. Is not that an amazing thought? And that brings us back to the issue we discussed briefly earlier. Here is why it's so important to see that the life of Christ, and not just his death, is an essential part of his atoning work. He lived a full, perfect life of obedience on our behalf, and therefore his perfect righteousness as a man counts for us in the reckoning of God. Did you ever wonder why at his baptism Jesus told John the Baptist, he insisted this was something we need to do. Matthew 3, verses 13 through 15 says this, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now, think about John's baptism. What did it mean? It was a symbol of repentance. John understood that. Jesus understood that as well. But he comes to be baptized by John, and John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? John the Baptist says, if one of us should be baptizing the other, you should be baptizing me. He understood. And Jesus, answering, said unto him, Suffer it to be so for now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. Now think about that. Again, John's baptism signified repentance. And John the Baptist understood this situation. Jesus was sinless. John was not. So if one should have been baptizing the other, John was really right. Jesus should have been baptizing John. He was the one that had cause for repentance. He wasn't sinless like Jesus was. But Jesus said, no, do this anyway. We need to do it to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill righteousness for whom? For whose sake? For his own? No, he had no need of repentance or baptism. But he did it for our sake, to fulfill the righteousness that would be ours by imputation. It was a complete and perfect righteousness encompassing even the symbol of our repentance. Again, this is the simple meaning of our text. I, I can't say it any more clearly than John, the Macar John MacArthur says it. I'll say that again. God treated Christ as if he committed all the sins of all the people who would ever believe so that he could treat them as if they had lived the perfect life of Christ. Therefore, Paul says, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. That's the gospel invitation. How can you do that? Forsake your love of sin and embrace Christ by faith. It's not a matter of working for it or doing any ritual to obtain it. It's simply a matter of believing. Turn from your sin and turn to Christ and trust him. And this great exchange of our sin for Christ's righteousness was the common theme in Paul's writings. He spoke of it in Romans 3 after spending two and a half chapters showing that everyone... Jews, pagans, and religious Gentiles, all of them are hopeless sinners, unable to save themselves. Paul says this in Romans 3, 21 and 22, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which 
is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them who believe. God's righteousness unto all and upon all those who believe. He's talking, again, about the imputation of God's righteousness to the believer. And what he's saying here is we lay hold of Christ's righteousness simply by faith. A few verses later, he says this, Romans 4, 5, to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And verse 6, God imputes righteousness apart from works. That is the gospel. That is the doctrine of justification by faith. Paul said his own singular hope for salvation lay not in himself, but Philippians 3, 9, to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. And so I ask, are you united with Christ by faith? Does your only hope lie in what he has done to absolute perfection as your substitute rather than trusting something you think you can do for yourself but could never do perfectly? Are you standing by grace before God in Christ's place, spiritually united with him, knowing by faith that he likewise has already stood in your place and borne the awful wrath of God against sin? And if not, I plead with you on behalf of Christ and on the authority of his word, be reconciled to God.